Imagine opening your email to find years of history deleted. Only a single email remains. A ransomware request for $2 million. You think to yourself, how could this happen to me? You see, there's two types of companies. Those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. The weight of responsibility comes crashing down on you. It's the sort of responsibility you feel when your family is craving a delicious pizza. You finally open the box only to find the most cringeworthy topping that you mistakenly ordered. Join Pineapple on Pizza podcast as John and George, along with guest executives, discuss the most common and craziest cybersecurity risks followed by actionable tips and strategies that can be implemented to protect your cyber risk pie. Pineapple on Pizza is hosted by Omnistruck. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pineapple on Pizza. Today, we've got an amazing guest. He's a two-time Pac-12 champion for the Stanford Cardinals as a goalkeeper. He's NSIN, starts Naval Tank, an inspection finalist. Welcome to our CEO and founder of Puzzle Twin, Kyle Orchu. Thanks for having me here. Glad, glad you could make it and, and glad the weather here isn't, isn't causing too many issues around the world here. So <laughs> we're, gonna, we're just going to jump right in here. So if cybersecurity was a pizza and the, and the frameworks were the, the crust, What's the riskiest topping you've seen and what topping would you equate that to? The riskiest topping. Well, you know, I, I am a huge fan of pizza and the least favorite topping on pizza that I have is anchovies. I don't know who came up with the idea of anchovies on pizza, but really in, in, in my line of work where the anchovies in my world would be if someone got control of my drones or fed it false GPS data, um, spoofing a satellite would be a worst case scenario because then a drone could be rerouted to a location that an adversary would, would want. And in my line of business, that could be disastrous because drones can lacerate people, especially if they don't have the, you know, a cage to protect. So yeah, that's kind of, that would be the anchovies on my pizza spoofing false GPS position data to my drones. <laughs> And, and and in regards to your role as CEO, what, what keeps you up at night? I mean, you, you just mentioned that, you know, obviously the blades and everything else is is, is there and, and somebody taking over those items. What what else would, would keep you up at night on that? Yeah. So what else would, would keep me up is if someone were, were to able were able to like siphon packets or sniff packets sent over um, you know, between the, on the video telemetry front. So like obviously like in radio communications, you have some kind of modulation going on and and if you know most people are not that adept to to catch on to that but if we have like private and public key encryption and we have like good aes standards um usually this is not a problem but in certain cases if, if someone forgets to um, encrypt a channel or something like that and then uh, we have a video telemetry that's going on um you know if, if we're handling sensitive information like or or flying around sensitive assets and someone were to, to be able to to get that get a hold of that video telemetry then i that, that's something that i i would be um really worried about um but i don't you know, if we take the necessary steps i'm not worried on a, on a good day but that's kind of what i think about that <laughs> so are there i mean you've got a number of faa regulations that you've got to meet and, and everything else and, and are you also looking at the security i mean obviously you're looking at some of the security regulations uh, so, so what's your what's your biggest challenge in meeting those those regulations? One of our biggest goals is to get a beyond visual line of sight clearance from the FAA. Like we don't have that now, but um, in order to get that, you need to you need to prove that you're the, you have like complete control of of your unmanned aircraft, and it's free from interference. It's it's not going to mess with um, other other airwaves uh, per se. Um, it's not going to mess with the communications of other aircraft. And it's also like, it, it needs to be able to return to home with a high degree of, of accuracy and certainty. And then there is a bunch of different 
kinds of uh, contingencies that 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 go with that. Um, what if what if um, the signal is lost? Um, what if the the constellation satellite constellation is unavailable for the drone? Uh, what if uh, the operator loses like RC signal or video telemetry, and then you have to have a contingency plan for all these different scenarios. And for BV loss, the beyond visual line of sight, uh, these are all things that need to be accounted for and prepared for essentially. I, I think we've, 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 we've heard some of that. Um, especially, I mean, it's kind of like when you're doing a flight, flight training or something else, right? You've got to, you, there's, there's more training that you need to, to fly at night or when there's clouds or, you know, non-visual. So mm -hmm. I, I can definitely see the same same need there for for the drones. So tell us about so tell us about your solution. What 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 did you what did you build and how are you building it so that uh, I, what what your what what is your solution for that? Yeah. So essentially, what we're trying to do at Causal Twin is to help architects get eyes in the sky and also eyes inside buildings. So one of the biggest pain points that we're addressing is that architects have to go on site and take a bunch of physical measurements by hand or take a bunch of pictures, take laser scalers and other tools to help them understand the dimensionality of space, of spaces that they're going to either refurbish, renovate, or completely tear down <laughs> and erect a new building on top of. So with our drones, we, we were creating drones that can fly indoors and outdoors and understand, have a heuristic for mapping those, those, those spaces really well. So currently there are other players in the space like drone deploy, where you can automate uh, waypoints um, and also waypoints as an X and Y location and also altitude. Uh, however, they don't have companies like that don't have capabilities to map indoor spaces. Uh, so we're using technology uh, such as uh, SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. And this is a very important uh, concept in robotics is when robots, like, a, like a, for example, a Roomba in your house uses 2D SLAM in order to get around. So it has like a, a 2D LiDAR on it that pings points in 360 degrees. And then as it moves around, it essentially creates a map, a floor plan. Of, of your kitchen, of your living room, of your bedroom, and that's how it gets around. So we're trying to adapt this Roomba problem to three dimensions and, and also um, to get an accurate um, 3D scan of the space so that architects can understand what exactly needs to be changed, what, what needs to be renovated, um, and then also track progress of construction. Uh, so that's those are the pain points that we're addressing for the architects and construction managers. And, and so are there any specific regulatory requirements besides, I mean, besides the FAA on that? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, are, are these are these buildings empty or are they looking at doing it for, for occupied buildings? How, you know, or anything along those lines? Yeah. So to be honest, like we, we are an early stage startup. So we're kind of following the mantra of move fast, break things, um, ask questions later. Obviously, we're not going to be operating with um, people inside we're going to clear all these buildings when we're flying indoors flying outdoors you know then then you have the FAA regulations that that come into play indoors um, they don't really have jurisdiction indoors uh, but there, there could be they could step in if they have to if you're being egregious but yeah like every pilot that operates commercial drones every pilot that accepts money for flying a drone needs to get a part 107 license which is an exception to fly um, small unmanned aircraft so that's the air, the acronym is suas small unmanned aircraft system and then you need to study for this test and you take it at like a, a local um like at a regional airport and right. so on and so forth um so about the people in the buildings really you just want to make sure you clear everyone out and you don't want to make a mistake because but if you if you have if you have the aircraft like be in a cage and also have ob basic obstacle avoidance, uh, generally you're you're going to avoid a workplace accident. Uh, but but yeah, th those are kind of those are those are the concerns that you have with with this kind of line of work. Great, and and so uh, the, the the goal on this is to be able to give the uh, save the time of the of the architect. Is that uh, for the most part, and 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 the building owner? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So 
the architect, you know, let's say you have an office in a major metro area and you have sites that are all over the place, like maybe sometimes even two, three hours away. Uh, it doesn't make sense for like if the architect forgets to take a picture of, let's say, a particular wall or, or a particular section of the building, they would have to drive back in order to get that information because they they work in absolute dimensions. Like if they don't have that, they're not going to make any, they're going to, they're not going to do guesswork. That's just not, that's just not how it works. So they'd have to come back on site and, and, you know, get whatever they, they forgot to get. Um, and then with the drone, um, essentially you could summon the drone and say, Hey, you know, uh, go, go scan this area. I don't even need to be there and then return the results to me. And I'm going to stay in my office and I'm going to go to my, my Keurig and put the cake up in and then, um, pour it and then the, the, the scan will be done. Excellent. So, so Kyle, tell me, so what events do you go to to learn more about this? Events, uh, to be honest, like, uh, haven't really gone to too many events, uh, but I've, I've, I have done customer discovery work um, by interviewing architects. Um, I, I used to be um, a model maker intern myself at an architecture firm in Palo Alto. And, and then COVID struck. And I kind of took a switch switch of gears with my career um, because I believe that computer science would be more resilient in terms of the delivery of instruction uh, during COVID at Stanford. So I kind of said, okay, I'm going to, I was about to sign off on being an architect myself. And then COVID happened and I signed to the computer science department instead. So, yeah. Oh, probably a good choice at that point. <laughs> yeah. All right. Are, are there any books you would recommend to, to, to learn more about this and, and, and how you're implementing, you know, cybersecurity solutions on, on top of your solution? I, I don't really have um, any books that come to mind. Um, I have I have books that come to mind for how to create a startup. Uh, but <laughs> you can but share those with us. I mean, that's fine, too. Yeah, the the startup owners manual is, is 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 good. So my my instructor um, Steve Blank. So I I took hacking for defense at Stanford, and essentially causal twin before it became causal twin was team Ankabot in this class. You know, we we were just a couple of guys that got together to to do some tinkering for national security, and we were given a problem by the Office of Naval Research to automate ballast tank inspections. So we were actually working in a completely different space uh, before we kind of incorporated. And we did a bunch of, we did a hundred customer interviews in 10 weeks, different stakeholders in the US Navy. And we discovered that they could have a great benefit by having remotely operated vehicles go into these rusty tanks, claustrophobic tanks that hold seawater fuel and other materials. Um, it could severely reduce uh, workplace hazards um, and also increase the fidelity of, of information that you can get. Because before inspectors would go into these tanks and then have like a piece of paper and take notes, maybe a printed copy of the blueprints. Uh, but with this kind of technology, you could create digital twins and then create annotations that are overlaid on, on these 3D models. And then you have much more pinpointed accuracy on the types of conditions, where they are located, and what steps can be taken to remediate, uh, whether it's rust, um, cracked welds, you know, dents, stuff like that. Uh, usually the biggest problem is corrosion in, in some of these ballast tanks. Uh, and this is not only a problem that the U.S. Navy was facing, also, you know, big shipping companies such as Maersk and uh, Chevron, they would also have problems with, with this. Um, and I will say to 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 the theme of the show, um, one of we're we're doing a project for one of our clients right now. Uh, we, not only do we do the the venture arm, we also have some clients, and that we're bootstrapping ourselves. And for one of our clients, we were working on a, a proposal um, for an SBIR proposal for a drone that could navigate confined spaces for the U.S. Navy. Okay, and for this project, they were concerned about cybersecurity because they looked at the entire market and they were like, okay, we can't use DJI, all right? DJI, uh, there was a report that came out. I don't know if it was confirmed or not that they have the capability to send information back to, back to mainland China. And for the DOD, the DOD uh, had this issued a statement that DJI is not acceptable for 
um, for our use cases anymore. Uh, and also issued a directive that, you know, like local and state governments should also have exercise caution when using DJI products. However, the market share for law enforcement and, and government use cases in drones is overwhelmingly DJI. Uh, but the DOD did, did kind of <laughs> boot them out. Um, but for the purposes of this project, uh, they wanted FIPS 140-2 uh, compliance. No. Uh, and, and there are four levels with that. I'm sure you're, you're completely aware. And um, however, what was funny was that the, the technical points of contact for this project, they, they slapped down this 140 standard and then they really had no idea what it was. Uh, I, I went ahead and I did research and I'm like, I'm looking at all the levels and then I'm just like, huh, why do we, I'm looking at levels two through four and tamper evidence, like hardware, like, so if someone like we're, we're, we're able to rip off the, the hardware, the, the crypto hardware module and, and gain access to it, it would need to be tamper evident. Like how, how does this really apply to drones? Um, so those levels, the, the language in those levels was kind of like, kind of like weird to apply to drones because you don't necessarily need some of those, those provisions, but at the same time, like the sentiment is, is, is good for a general kind of umbrella. Um, but I think there should be new standards um, that that should be specific to drones. Like, so they kind of slap this very umbrella term onto it. They slap the entire framework on you, which is yeah. which is typical. How's that? Yeah. And, and sometimes they don't. Yeah, sometimes they're just told, yeah, that, that this is what you should use without checking it. And we 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 find that a lot sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So, so tell me, Kyle, what, what excites you about the future? Uh, the, I mean, we, you know, obviously, you know, mapping these, uh, you know, mapping these things and saving people time. Uh, but what, what else excites you about the future in the industries? What really excites me is the fact that we can digitize the world, the world, essentially. This sounds a little cliche. It's already being done. Um, but there is this report that I read by McKinsey that, digital supply chains is kind of like the future. So imagine just kind of digitizing your economy and then being able to kind of play around with it, like maybe induce a, a supply shock here, you know, remove a couple of these vendors, say they got bought out by foreign nationals and, and they are no longer wanting to do business. Imagine your digital supply chain and you're just playing around with it, poking around with it like a, like a puppet, right? And you can just simulate all these bad actions by adversaries or, you know, adverse adverse events such as natural disasters or, or any kind of, yeah, pandemics, right? And what, what's really amazing about that is if you create a model such that it is complex enough to model all the idiosyncrasies and the nuance in, the, in, in, the, in a particular segment of the economy, you can't do this for the entire country. Uh, but let's say it's mission critical to either national security or or like a critical sector of our economy. So with that, you can actually do some pretty interesting things. And in this report, um, you could actually uh, create really robust contingency plans for when things go bad using these digital twins of supply chain and uh, the economy. And, you know, people might ask me, what, what does this mean? Right. It just means that, like, you have a really good representation um, of what assets you have and like what goods are exchanging hands and you know what is the expected shelf life and all of this stuff but again like stuff like this has already been implemented but not at a not at a scale that that can create a really robust plan for for governments for you know higher level decision makers because you know government is usually behind on this kind of stuff you know they they're usually laggard so I'm sure you guys know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not just the government, you know, laggard situation. It's also the storytelling that's difficult for, you know, we can talk about flux capacitors and doohickeys all day long, and most people aren't going to understand. Um, but when you're talking about lawmakers and legislators, um, you know, having a story behind something is important. So, uh, for example, we were years ago, I was working on let's just say a bunch of flux capacitor stuff is called delay tolerant networking and you know, latency and those sorts of things, right? Which is the average lawmaker is going to be like, he's speaking English, but I don't know what the hell he's saying, right? So, um, 
anyway, the long story short is we got to tell a story about, hey, you know, we need to figure out how to get first responders um, connected when they go and deal with disasters. And the issue is, is that they can't communicate each other with each other in their radios. And so if there is an event, we need something that can heal the network, like a natural disaster event. And that ended up being applied in Hurricane Katrina years ago in Louisiana. Um, and one of the prototype models we worked on um, with Naval Postgraduate School, specifically a guy named Brian Steckler, and we deployed this NEMO, what's called a NEMO unit. So that was essentially means it can heal communications, cell communications, internet communications, anything that was possible through these mobile units you would drive around after a flood, right? And so the story there was it worked and we saved people from attics, people stuck in their attics, we saved their lives, right? That's something a lawmaker or legislator can understand, right? And so those stories become important because that then ended up evolving into what's called delay tolerance networking for getting the internet on Mars with JPL, and some of the folks working on that project, right? And so it started with what essentially was terrestrial-based or basically ground-based healing, and then turned into an application in space, which, you know, crazy enough, it, it makes sense if you tell the story, right? So, because um, we had those same experiences. So I'm curious, what's your story that you tell to make people understand what you do? Yeah, my, my, story, my story is really simple. The, the mission of of me and, and the company is just, just to provide the tools necessary for people to make the best decisions possible without necessarily being on site all the time, you know, without having to be there, having this companion or this suite of tools to make sure that you are present, but not in person, but with all the, all the necessary information that you need to make a decision as if you were there. That's kind of, that's kind of what, the mission is at the crux. Okay, gotcha. Because I like in my mind, the story I'm I heard, you know, through in technical interpretation was, hey, we have a building, it's been damaged, people can't go in because they could die. Let's get our drone, deploy it, we'll do an inspection because our drone technology can three-dimensionally look at this environment. Right. And so by sending the drone instead, um, you know, it saved lives because there was a time when the drone was flying through and it got squished because something failed. And that could have mm -hmm. been a huge and we sort right. of saved, we saved lives, right? There's a story, right? That, um, you know, that resonates and, and makes sense to, you know, but that also puts you into this position potentially to be like, oh, so you're the drone, you know, just in case of a disaster. And then you get kind of pigeonholed if you tell the story without other stories of, you know, all these applications on, on how your technology works um, or how it benefits in, in a way that I always say, if a lawmaker can understand it or a jury could understand it, then you're you're out you're good right if, you, if it gets too technical then um that's great for you know the back end research and due diligence and those sorts of things but I, I always struggle with that you know what's what's the story you know in terms of the applications that um that you can solve and you know and and so from from your perspective you know I, i'm sure there's tons of different stories that you can tell because I see them all in my head as you're talking about them right and uh you know that that i think is that's the wonderful part of what essentially is the futures of drone technology and, you know, what can it actually accomplish for you um, and becomes a market opportunity as well at the same time. So everybody wins. Yeah. I think one story that I think I can share, not, not from personal experience, but from what I read was, you know, the condo collapses here in Florida that occurred. Um, did you guys hear about that? Yep. Yeah. So I guess one application or one story that, or narrative that we can we can provide to you know to the government or to local state officials is that why not have our technology used as a compliance checkpoint or a series of checkpoints such that when buildings are being constructed the quality of that construction is an open audit essentially uh, the you know bureau of whatever bureau in the local government that manages uh, construction permits you know, can have an open view into how the building is being constructed. And then they can see how that changes over time, right? And then they can potentially catch errors before, before you know, you get too far into the rabbit hole, right? If, if you have the wrong, like if you have the wrong radius on a, on a support pillar in your parking garage and, and you're, you know, building on top of it, it's already too late, right? If, if yeah. you have an I-beam that is, actually not wide enough to support the load 
or you ordered the wrong part and it came to the site and you put it, you installed it anyway because of miscommunication. That, that is the story, right? Because cost overruns and safety occur when, when you miss, when you make a mistake early on in a, in a project, because, because of the consecutive nature of construction, you know, when, <laughs> when, when you build the foundation and then you build on top of it, you can't change that foundation. So having something that, that can catch this would not only benefit the investors and whoever's funding the building, it would benefit the construction company, the contractors, and also the local, the local government. They could have an open audit into the quality of the construction of, of a commercial building and in, in interest. Yeah, that's a great example of an application. I think there's, there's probably many more. Um, it's always the difficult choice to choose what stories you're telling in what situations. But, you know, I think the, 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 the fun part is that the futures and the things that you're excited about, what can happen, um, are, are what I think the, the listener, whoever is, is listening, whether it's a buyer or it's a lawmaker or whomever it is, can grab onto and retell that story easily. And that is kind of the outcomes of what we deliver, I think, in aggregate when it comes to the standard response. The concern has always traditionally been very focused on what outcomes saving lives, right? right? And the interesting part of cyber risk and what we do is that that is being inserted as part of every, like it's automatically getting inserted to every discussion. So it's not necessarily just about building the building, but the issue of, okay, what if somebody does take control of the dro drone in the construction process and they, um, the drone is, is then um, spoofed or compromised in a way that um, wrong information is provided and then it becomes a disaster. Right? And so that's always the balance, right? So when we talk about cyber risk in, in, our, in our world, it's often tied to that issue of, okay, where is the cybersecurity and cyber risk in everything that's being done, especially in an internet delivered world? And so, um, so all the points that you made early on, you know, are, the fact that you're security first, you know, in that mindset and, and how you're describing your technology, it, that's a win in itself. And in, in our, at least in our experience, you know, I don't think any buyer is going to move forward with any kind of investment that's technology oriented if they can't prove that it's secured and and that's part of the that's part of your natural dna so i'm really excited about what's 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 coming in terms of what you're working on because that's so critical these days yeah yeah and to add to your point there's also you know there are certain projects that clients don't necessarily want that information getting leaked out there somewhere like if it, if it's a special project and let's say we have a drone flying in a special project and we sign some kind of confidentiality agreement the we can only have so much edge processing on on the drone right so sometimes we we may need to relay the the scan data over over network and then then eventually to the cloud for for some kind of gpu compute and in this process we need to make sure that the, the flow of information is is secure um, from, from the physical, like land perspective, and also from, from the land to, to, let's say like AWS, uh, which, which we've partnered with and then creating the, you know, I'm, I'm just the CEO. So like, I don't know the specifics of everything, but I just know that we would need to properly configure like and harden our uh, cloud environment to, to ingest the data from our sites, which came from the drone. And then do some kind of processing on that when we create our three D models and and you know when we need the the GPUs to calculate the geometry of of the the point clouds uh, that that we're collecting. So definitely important. Yeah, and all applicable, and you know everything you've said is all applicable. I think the the, the poignant the, we call it store and forward in the networking world. When you know if you lose a connection, right? And you're supposed to be connected to the cloud all the time, but that's not always a realistic, especially at a construction site. So, so being able to store, what, what do you, what, what store points do you have within the system and how do you get it off of the system in case the, the, um, the drone itself has an issue, I imagine is in part of the high level, um, you know, design process that you've gone through. But you know, the funny thing is, is that 
um, that's not necessarily funny. It's just reality is that there's now a process before you even get to the ink in a contract or before somebody starts to nod their head and say, yes, that companies have to achieve first, like a CMMC requirement, if you're dealing with a DOD subcontractor, which is basically a supply chain blessing. It's a, yes, you meet the need or FedRAP. Yes, you meet the need um, like Amazon, Microsoft, and, and Google have had to attain, right? And, uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to do all the time. So, and as well as on international basis. And so these all become part of what essentially is the barriers to moving a piece of technology into the market. And, you know, most buyers and lawmakers aren't super technical. So they're looking for that, that attestation, that, that, that blessing, so to speak. So that's what we do. And, and, uh, you know, it's very interesting to hear your story about how those, uh, outcomes, uh, and those requirements of those outcomes, um, in the, in the actual solution itself, already knowing that you have a cybersecurity mindset. So, so thank you for that because not a lot of organizations do. So, yeah, yeah, of course. So, so Kyle, tell us a little bit about, about, about yourself now. I mean, so how, how did you, you know, where, where did you come from and how did you get to this point? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, like I had no idea I would, I would be doing what I'm doing right now in high school. I grew up in Northwest Indiana in a small town and went to public school and played soccer, um, for the Chicago fire Academy. And did that for six years from 2012 to 2018, played for that academy. And then um, I had a high enough profile that I was able to come to Stanford. And I was I was offered a scholarship. And then I I competed for for a couple of years. And then my last year, I I left the team to focus, you know, on on school a little bit more. And then I took some entrepreneurial classes and, and I I realized that this this is really what's what's clicking with me. Like I I love. I love solving problems and kind of talking to people and just listening, you know? So that's, that's kind of the nutshell for, for how I got here. And, and, and where did you work before this? I worked at second front. So, you know, talk about FedRAMP, you know, a competitor to FedRAMP, I guess, or a process that they, they thought a Cato, you know, continuous authority to operate kind of, on ramping process that was supposedly faster than FedRAMP. Um, and I'm sure you've heard of Platform One. So FedRAMP and Platform One were kind of like um, the mechanisms by which companies could get their software credited for government use. And Second Front uh, was providing a, a much quicker process to those, those alternatives that were provided by the government. And also Platform One was, was losing funding uh, so they they couldn't take on as many um, as many clients or clients, but like companies to to get approved. Um, so shrinking funding for platform one, FedRAMP was slow. Uh, so that that's where Second Front was was able to come in and and uh, provide a, a service for for Cato. Excellent. You know, if you could go back in time and give your high school self or your 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 previous self advice, what would that what would that advice be? I'd say just trust that everything happens for a reason. Given the, the name of my company, Causal Twin, like just don't read into the causation too much of one event to another. Just just live life and know that you will converge on what you want to do regardless of whether you're aware of it or not. And you don't have to be hyper aware of it. You just have to be living life to your fullest and just being true to yourself. And eventually um, you will converge on what you want to be doing. So don't, don't stress, you know? <laughs> well, I, I, obviously, you know, one of your passions was drones uh, and, and soccer. So, so tell us, I mean, so what, you know, what, what are those passions? I mean, what do you do outside of work that, that really keeps you going? So funny story. The, the way that I got into drones was because of soccer. Uh, and here, here's why. So my sophomore year, I didn't get too much playing time. So there's a, a limited amount of spots that you can have on the bench, right? You can't have, like, if you have a team of 30 guys, they're not going to, you're not going to suit up all 30, right? 
because only 11 can play at a time. And then usually you only need like seven subs. So you have like an 18 that, that is suiting up and, and, you know, playing and being subbed in, subbed out, yada, yada. Right. Yeah. So what happens with the, the 12 other guys, right? Yeah. We 12 call other them, guys. Are, pardon me. They, they call them red shirts these days. I think they used to call them red shirts back then. So I was a red shirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what, are, what do the other guys do, right? Other guys, they, uh, they, you know, take, take notes to do some scouting work. They, they, um, assist with filling up water, all this stuff, um, kind of behind the scenes work, right. To, to help the team, anything to help the team, even if you're not suited up, even if you're not dressed. Right. So in preseason, I was, the team had the drone essentially, uh, and I would record games from the sky. So from roughly a hundred feet up, like just, just hovering above our, our stadium lights. I had, I had a, a drone that would have the gimbal angled down and then have a top down view for our formation. <laughs> and then we were able to get some pretty cool insights into how other teams were able to penetrate our back line. Um, and I was able to, so I, I would go fly the drone and then I would hand over the footage at halftime and the coaches would, would make adjustments. And I would not fly over the field. That, that would be crazy. Uh, I would fly pretty far like back, but also angled such that it was kind of a top-down view. So believe it or not, that's soccer is how I got into drones because I was not dressing up that much and I would just I would just fly for the coaches. <laughs> data is data is almost as important, right, as playing the game sometimes. So yeah. so what what else? I mean, what else is a is a passion for you? I I love running. I love uh, cycling. Those are, those are my main activities these days, but there's not much time for anything else at this point. So now, now when you're running a company, definitely understand that. Yeah. Great. So where can people find you, Kyle? They can find me on LinkedIn. I, I provided some links. My, my blog as a heads up is really old. Um, it probably still says that I'm looking for an internship or something. So <laughs> Yeah, you can find me. Our website is causaltwin.ai. So you can see what we're up to. But really, we're kind of like in grind mode. So you probably won't see much for, for a while. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah, fun state. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you so yeah. much for Kyle Orchu. What a pleasure. You know, um, really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, and I know, John, so I, I think, uh, at least from from the perspective of of, of cyber risk, uh, you know, sometimes these conversations, uh, you know, evolve into you know really amazing and interesting topics depending upon who we're talking to. And I think this is one of those this is one of those golden gems. We look forward to see what's to come with your organization and uh, um, the the challenges that you face. I'm sure are going to be exciting, uh, especially in the the state that you're in. And you know, we'll, we'll be rooting for you. Thanks right. so much. Well, thank you, audience, for listening. And, and if you learned something or laughed or, or, you know, want to know more about drones, please tell somebody about this podcast. Kyle Orchu, we appreciate your time and and, and thank you. Uh, there it is. It's been another great episode of, of Pineapple on Pizza with your hosts, John and George. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you all for joining another great episode of Pineapple on Pizza. You can find show notes, links, and resources by visiting omnistruct.com forward slash blog. And a huge thank you to all who are preventatively protecting organizations from cyber threats.